we can this one. Welcome to the Visual Storytelling Podcast. My name is Fred Ranger, and I'm so happy that you're joining us this week for another very inspirational conversation. Today is a special day because I have actually a friend of mine on the podcast. He's also a director of photography, a very talented photographer, and an all-around great guy. We have Luca Rupnik on the show today. So Luca, first of all, how are you, my friend? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. You're Great. getting into the spring mood, so uh, looking forward for the, to some sun, sunshine. Yeah, man. Uh, we've been uh, chatting a lot over the past few weeks about going out and shooting and so on and so forth. Um, and we, we haven't delivered on that, so we, we have to make sure that uh, <laughs> we do go out in Montreal and, and go shoot together. But first of all, uh, Luca, for the people on uh, the show who don't know you, Um, can you walk us through a bit of uh, how you found photography and and why you decided to invest time, effort, and make it your make it your job basically? Um, it, for me, it's a pretty obvious um, road to photography. My father was a photographer. Um, he was a medical photographer, so he worked at the uh, University of Montreal when I was young, and then later on at the General Hospital. So you know, when I used to go to see my dad at work, I'd hang out in a dark room and watch him develop pictures. Um, and he, I mean, he documented our whole family life on film. So there's boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of negatives, films, photos of, 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 you know, our whole life. But I mean, I just through him, you know, obviously gained an appreciation of, of image of, uh, photography too, because he was, he's a big fan of, uh, of movies and like we watch You know, I watched movies way earlier than I ever should have when I was a kid, but in a nice way. They were always well, you know, I think I watched The Godfather when I was six. I watched Jaws when I was seven. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> it was never weird, you know, but it was always movies, lots of Hitchcock movies and stuff like that. So, like, image and 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 um, these things were always accessible to us. Like, uh, you know, he had we always had cameras. We had a video camera when I was, I think, six or seven years old, which was this panasonic thing where you had to carry around the the vcr with you so you had like a, a shoulder strap with like a half vcr and then that plugged into the camera and i used to just you know make special effects when i was a kid try to redo stuff i saw in star wars or whatever movie i liked i tried to recreate special effects make short movies so i was, I was always playing with cameras and um and that stayed with me really f up until today but for a long part of my life my focus was actually more music than image I played in bands, uh, you know, I toured, I did a lot of stuff until in my mid thirties, I guess. And up until that point, I was always kind of the documentary, a documentarian, document, document, I documented basically always all my bands. So I had like, I always had a camera. I always took pictures. I always filmed stuff. So it was, it was always part of who I was to be the guy who took pictures, who made sure that we had document, visual documents of what was going on. So I had boxes and I have boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of photos and negatives of all, all those periods. And like, I mean, I think I know my, you know, I know I'm probably I have more images of my bands and they even know that I have. Um, and then I kind of moved into the professional world of image. Oops, sorry about that. I moved into to the professional world of image pretty late, actually, like in my mid 30s. I mean, I used to like, again, I worked in the music industry. I was a music guy, always keeping images like you know, photography and video kind of as a passion thing. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, I, I, I was working in the music industry. I lost my job. They cut my position. And then I just had a time to think about what I really wanted to do. And I'm like, well, you know, this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to be, you know, I studied cinema in school. I, I mean, the image is supposed to be what I'm doing. So I just said, okay, I have a year of unemployment. Let's get the ball rolling. And I just kind of not caught my way into jobs, but I took jobs that I didn't know how to do, knowing that I had time to learn how to do them before they started. I started editing and then I just, naturally took the camera and then did camera, camera, camera. And then, you know, over the last maybe six or seven years, I qualified myself as a director first and then a director of photography second and as a photographer third, but even photographers all around, like it's always been there. Um, yeah. And so I got to work on a lot of cool stuff. Like, I mean, I went to the Cannes film festivals for two years. I worked on the Anthony Bourdain shows when they came to Montreal, uh, where in, you know, two relatively short, but intense periods of time, I probably learned more than I had learned anywhere else. 
I got lucky to be well, lucky. I hate that word lucky, but you know, I had the chance to be quickly uh, taken into the shoot studio group where I had a lot of really, really good men. Like I have a, like a, you know, someone I consider a mentor there, Jean-Francois Graton. Um, and just people that inspire me every day. And then, you know, every just camera, camera, cameras. I just, <laughs> and, 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 and I, you know, I'm a bit of a tech nerd too. So it's, it's well, that's, that, that's the thing, right? So we, we always have our, our tech conversation our our guitar conversation and our cameras and, and art conversation going at uh, you and I, and this is what, one thing I appreciate from you is that, uh, and this is why we, you and I are, are, are friends, I guess is because we have that, you know, similar path of liking a certain form of art, which is music, invest in time in it, but then also realizing that there, wow, there's, there's other form of arts that where you can express yourself and photography, videography is, is definitely one of them. But Luca, I, I, you did mention that you picked up a camera, start to tell stories and so on and so forth. Um, what actually made you uh, go to an environment where you actually made it your job, right? So there's always two paths. You can keep it a, as a passion uh, project, but at, at some point, some people decide to make it uh, their job. And I want I want to hear you out on, does it feel sometimes like if it's, you know, mining the other aspect, which is passion driven, uh, the fact that, that it's your job, or is it actually fueling on the opposite, the fact that it's your job? Um, for me, it, it's all fuel. I mean, I, I, it's it's really fun to be able to. I think, and I think we're in a time where I'm pretty much everyone who wants to do it can. Where you, I'm doing what I want to do in life. You, you know, I mean, like you know, you see people that have jobs that are jobs, and and there's, there's never any judgment. Like some people just need to take care of their families, need to take care of themselves, and they have jobs that if they lost, you know, and got another one, it, it you know, it wouldn't, it doesn't have that sort of impact on their life as a part. It's a means to you know to 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 take care of your family and stuff like that. And those are all fine. Um, but I'm really doing what I want to do in life. And I mean, I knew that a long time ago that this is what I wanted to do in life. Like, I mean, I went, I studied this in school. Um, I was gearing up for that. And then sometimes life kind of takes over and things happen that kind of put you down another path. Um, and at some point you kind of like, you know, I started to accept that maybe this wasn't going to happen. And then all of a sudden, like, like again, the best thing that ever happened was me losing that job. And having a door open at an age where like it's kind of the time to make a choice and it's just okay you know i'm gonna make this happen so for me uh it, it's it's it was born as a passion and became a profession and they coexist in a way where one inspires the other sometimes i you know sometimes i work too much i don't have enough time to do things that <clears throat> excuse me that maybe are are more creatively you know stimulating towards me i mean it, it's normal in my line of work like i do a lot of advertising and a lot of creative stuff as well i do some tv um there's things that are job jobs and there's things that are cool jobs and there's some that are just like wow i would do this for free if i if i didn't have to um if i wasn't getting paid you know i mean like a lot of the i did some, I did some like large scale concert filmings which were just really really fun to do and i mean for me it was super exciting i had to learn you know, 100 pages of classical music sheets and manage seven cameras across seven locations on like a lot, like, you know, and it's just for me, it's like these type of things where it's like a mix of technical and creative and imagination that just, you know, keep, they drive me to really try to be better at what I do. Um, and it's funny, as, as like it goes along, like, you know, you sort of make a name for yourself and you know that you'll always have professional work and, you, and you, you're able to start putting in more time to do your personal stuff. And, you know, I, I think, you know, the personal stuff is sometimes what defines you a bit more as an artist. Um, but the professional work, you know, is is what lets you buy more cameras. Um, <laughs> to, f- to fill the, 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 the same of... the same disease we have, the, the gas disease we have. <laughs> yeah, it was a yeah. syndrome. Oh, by, uh, <laughs> Um, but it's, 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 it's fun how they coexist. And like, I mean, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I happily balance the two. There's sometimes where I could do three months of work that doesn't necessarily inspire me creatively, but it allows me to, to work on an aspect of something that I haven't done. Like I did a green screen job a, a couple of years ago, which was in all honesty, a nightmare of a job. It went on way too long. It wasn't fun and it wasn't cool. But now <clears throat> I can handle green screens, you know, with with one hand behind my back, and that's a new tool. So even things that aren't necessarily completely connected to what drives me, I take what I can to make everything else better. I'll let you have a sip of water, <laughs> um, Lika. Let, let's go back to to <coughs> image. Um, so you did mention that uh, you were driven by you know capturing 
engaging images and so on and so forth. I want to bring you into a territory where there's obviously no right answers or wrong answers, but what for you makes a great image, regardless if it's, if it's still or moving image? Um, I think regardless of whether or not there are people involved, I mean, it, it, it ties in exactly to the name of your podcast is, is there's a story to tell. And I mean, for me, like I, I have a hard time admiring a picture that's empty. Um, and by empty, it doesn't mean like you could have one thing and one thing, you know, one object, but that object tells a story or, it, or makes you think about a story or makes you try to imagine what it, what it was. Um, you know, like even like we'll say yesterday, I, I haven't looked at the pictures I took, but I went for a walk yesterday, even, you know, just to do some research for a project and, and it was, you know, it wasn't a very nice day. It was gray, still snowy. And as I was walking by Parc Jean Mans, there was a guy playing soccer in the snow, wearing shorts and sneakers and a t-shirt and it didn't make sense at all it was cold it wasn't nice out it was a great day and there's just this guy alone kicking the ball and i caught a shot of it you know and i don't and, I, and again i'll look at the shot later on it may be good it may not be good but at least it, it you're intrigued by what this story could be like why is this guy there you know and sometimes it's it's a puddle sometimes it's a tree sometimes it's a plant but there's always something you know i'm very drawn to to to, to story i'm drawn to lines also for me lines tell stories also, and i always have to have kind of a master line in my image, which, which guides you. And I'm, I'm naturally pulled towards lines in a strange way. Like if there's one, if there's not one line that makes sense in my picture, it, uh, for me, it's, it's something's off, but it's basically story. I mean, it's, it's yeah. for me, it's what makes it, what pulls you into a story. And it's what allows everyone to have an, their own point of view or their own opinion of a photo. If something's too obvious or too blatant, what it is, then I don't think there's much room for interpretation. There's not much room for feeling. It might be a, a perfect photo, but it becomes a technical thing more than an emotional thing. And for me, like it's it's emotion that drives images, whether it's a little emotion or a big emotion, like something has to kind of get your brain turning in a certain way to make it to make an image work. Yeah, I, I love how you said emotion uh, drives image and, uh, and, and of course story. So that's the whole, the whole point of, uh, of why we do this. Um, speaking of, uh, visual storytelling. So, so how do you transfer all that, you know, knowledge and that intention of telling a story into movies, or I know you do music videos and so on and so forth. So how do you bring that creativity mm -hmm. into a 24 frames per second constantly for three minutes type of medium when, you know, on a single frame, it's a very different experience and one would say that it might be not easier but quicker to basically capture a scene capture a story but how do you do that for three minutes or even you know 20 minutes on a short duck or even two hours on a movie <laughs> um when i when i worked on the anthony bourdain show it was the first time the uh, director of photography was a guy named Zach Zamboni, <clears throat> and he still does a lot of stuff. He's a fantastic guy, and he's they were one of the things I admired about that show was how open, how how um, how generous he was with information and sharing, like you know, work tips and how to manage stuff. You know, we had like six, seventeen hour work days to do a lot of stuff, but you know, I mean, and one of the first things he told me was is one, never hold a shot for less than than ten seconds because it'll be wasted, which was which is a silly thing to think of, but it, it forces you to count take your time, breathe, and then, you know, you get it. And also how just character first, you know, like if, if you don't care about what's in front of you, to, you know, no one else will either, or very few people. So, um, it, you know, like, we'll say if I take, for example, like the, um, the last couple of things I did that I really enjoyed doing that I'm really proud of are the, the two latest uh, videos from Matt Halabowski for his new record. And basically, you know, when you direct stuff, you're given, you know, it's not always you that comes up with the idea, but you're the one who has to kind of figure out how to make the idea come to life. So I was given an idea and it's, then it's just, you know, you look at what, you know, there's boring things that you have to take into account, like budget, time, how many days you have to shoot, what to get to shoot with, blah, 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 blah. But I forget about those quickly. And the, the, the main, the main driving point is, you know, how do I tell this story? in an effective way, in a way that people will understand or in a way that people might not understand, but they'll be, that'll resonate with them. You know, and, and again, it's hard. Like the first video I did for him for his new record was a six and a half minute song where half of it, two thirds of it was instrumental. Wow. And and that that for me was the biggest, one of the biggest challenges I've had where a song has its opening. All the emotional punch is in the first 
third of the song and then the rest is kind of like this dwindling instrumental part and it's a very gutsy opening song single to release beautiful song but i've never had more challenge fitting in story into that but then again you take what's in front of you and then you say okay well this is what we have to tell and you know how much time do i give to this part how much time do i give to that part who can i use to push these things and who are like the characters that i have in front of me um because I've done a lot of music videos where it's live performances, and that's a whole different story. But when you're working with actors or people that you need to be actors, um, it's a whole different game of management and, and storytelling that you have to do. And I, I, you know, I'm not shy to say that. I, I geek out on spec stats and stuff like that. But I remember one of the first things I learned when I was a musician was learn everything to forget it. And it's the same thing I kind of apply to, to filmmaking or, or photography. It's just everything is there, but you don't need to think about it. And when you don't think about it, that's when you connect to emotions. That's when you connect to a story. And that's when you could really kind of do what you got to do as opposed to thinking about limitations or, you know, one plus three is seven. Then that's my, you know, like any sort of math you got to do to figure out stuff. I mean, I'm super instinctive about everything. So a lot of times once it comes time to shoot, I'll even throw away everything I plan and just go with what makes sense and what feels right. And oftentimes, you know, to my, to my credit or to my luck, it is, you know, like I find I'm I'm uh I'm never better than when I trust my instincts fully, and then the second I sort of start second guessing what I do, that's when I regret or when I when mm. I feel like I've made a mistake. It might not be a mistake, but it's when I feel like I've made a mistake. Yeah, I mean that's that's so true, and um, there's something to be said about you know it is a very technical type of um, environment where you deal with cameras and shutter speeds and ISO and all this great stuff. Uh, and I, I don't even want to think about video. It's even more <laughs> complicated to get things <laughs> right. But at the end of the day, getting th there, there's no there's no such thing as a perfect exposure or a uh, 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 having a perfect image that doesn't exist. There, there's there's the story you're trying to tell, and sometimes not having an image in focus. And I I, I really invite the, the listeners to go see the videos that you produced uh, or that you directed. Sorry uh, for Matt because I see a choice and there are a lot of choices like having a grainy image you know at the beginning and i i really like that and some other people would say well this isn't this is this is not a perfect image this is not a, a perfectly a clean and so on and so forth so i think uh, uh, that is very true what you're saying and we need to see more of that right because i i, I don't know if you're like me but we've seen in the past i would say 10 years a lot of technician of photography and videography trying to get the best image and the sharpest mm -hmm this and that and sometimes you know if you're doing product photography yeah you have to have a sharp image and the product needs to be well lit and so on and so forth but if you're more you know on the artistic side of things uh, that's what i want to see i want to see your gut i want to see the personality of both the artist and the person trying to translate what the artist is you know trying to say through their songs or through their painting or whatever mm -hmm. the whatever you're you're documenting so i think uh, there is a space and there is a place and i i start to see more younger i would say um uh, filmmakers and photographers going to that route heck some people are even ditching digital and going to film we were having a conversation about it pre-show but uh what's your view on that what's your view of the industry and where it is today and where it's going tomorrow well let's see well, you, you brought up a good point too because for me it's one it's been one of my big internal struggles like i'm a technical person i said it before but i'm also a very creative person you know like some, someone kind of made the the joke that I'm like half Spielberg and half David Lynch. And it's kind of true in a sense where... This is not a bad mix to have, by over, the way. <laughs> no, no. And I, and I by no means put myself in their, their realm of talent. But, you know, I'll take it anyway. But like half of me just wants things to be out of focus and fuzzy and soft and grainy. And the other half wants it to be as sharp as possible, as clean as possible. And like I'll, I'll use an example. Like I went to... Um, and it's part of where things are going now too. So it's kind of on topic. Like I went to Mexico a couple of weeks ago to Mexico City, and and the 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 driving point of the the, the visit was a, a friend of mine was going on a tour there. And before the pandemic, this friend of mine, I'd played music with him, and he had asked me to play guitar on a tour that was going to Mexico, and then it all got canceled. So we never really got to live that experience. So this time he was going with a band that I wasn't part of. Um, but he said, and you know, I said, well, I don't have my kids those five days. I'll, I'll go. Um, I'm I'm just gonna go. So I left and. Like I've been to Mexico City before, uh, I'm comfortable there, but it, it can be a a pretty intense place oh, and yeah. not necessarily the safest place. So like I, I, I'm recently when I travel, I only bring my film camera. Yeah. Um. So uh, and again, and I just bought my A7R5, so there was no way I'm bringing that one to you know nope. unsafe territory <laughs> for now. Yeah. 
I trust myself and I, you know, I'm lucky that I'm a six foot six, 230 pound guy who, who's physically imposing. So I, I, you know, most people won't bother me, but anyway, um, but I shot like, um, I, I said, I'll, I'll shoot some concert pictures. I put, I put in some like a uh, ISO 3200 film. And I saw, I shot some like street shots and I shot some concert shots. And it was, and it was about 10 other people there that were shooting with like digital cameras at, at the shows. And I, and you know, a couple of days later, I saw like on Instagram, the photos that were coming out from all these people. And they were like, you know, typical concert shots where they're flash lit and like, you get, you see all the action and all my shots were ultra low light, ultra noisy. Grainy AF. <laughs> Grainy triple AF. <laughs> But you know what? Like they felt like the show. They for me, they felt more like what we were living through than anything else. So yeah. um, it's weird that 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 with all the technology that I love and that I, I grab onto, for me, I feel more real with a film camera. Anyway, you know, I, like I mean, I just bought the, this the A seven R five and I love it and I use it a lot. But I feel like when I want real stuff, I go to film. And like I shot like some street shots also that were just like noisy as heck, but like beautifully noisy too. And I'm like, you know, this for me feels real. And also like, you know, there, there's, there's, it's funny because I saw a thing the other day where like the, the new vintage is like an iPhone one that people like yeah. are using that to take pictures now. And that's like kind of a new cool thing, which is kind of hilarious because like for us, you know, I think for us, like digital noise isn't, isn't the same <laughs> feeling as film grain. Yeah. But for this generation, like digital noise is the film grain. So it's kind of kind of neat that like this idea of imperfection is good. I think it's healthy because, you know, perfection in every sense of the word doesn't exist. And it's, a, it's an unhealthy thing to strive for also physically or, or realistically because, you know, what's perfect for you, I might think is, okay, it's nice. What's perfect for me, you might think is beyond perfect or just meh. You know, it's art is is personal. So this idea of perfection doesn't matter you know it's it's more do you believe in it do you feel it's right so for me like what's right is you know capturing moments in a real and authentic way that tell stories and you know recently i find like that just the way film is the way you use film forces you to kind of go down that road too and i kind of feel like it's it's a uh, it's catching on everywhere in a certain sense like i see more yeah. i see less like perfect things and more real things. And it feels good to see that too. You know, whether I connect with it or not, it's just kind of refreshing to see people opening themselves up to being normal or, or, or accepting reality as it is. Well, as, as a proof point, I think uh, Kodak actually uh, uh, catch that drift because they are jacking up the price of film. So yeah, so we're not uh, dreaming <laughs> Jesus, about this. It's really, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's really happening. By the way, that, yeah. that, that photo of, uh, uh, it's called Random Alley. On uh, we'll put your your Instagram in the in the show notes. Uh, wow, that's that's such a great photo. And for all the reasons that you just stated, this is you know bringing us into a instant uh, uh, mindset, instant mood, and also the way you you capture that guy in in that alley and mm -hmm. that grain. Man, this is a this is a a serious grain check uh, moment, and I'm I'm loving it. I'm every <laughs> I'm, I'm loving every single point of grain in it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, yeah. there's a photographer that I, I'm oh, sorry, there's a, that I admire a lot. And he, I, again, he, unfortunately he passed away this year, but his name was George Zimbel mm. and he, he's, um, he's a Canadian photographer, but he, or Canadian American. And, and, um, he, he, I mean, he's, he saw everything and he was everywhere. Like he was, a, he was a photographer for the New York times. He photographed like JFK. Uh, he was, you know, he was a very renowned street photographer, a fascinating guy. And, and he, he was at the, the, the place where there was the famous Marilyn Monroe shot with her, her dress going yeah. up and he, and like with his photograph, he yeah. was the, he was the first and he was the photographer that decided that what was more interesting than Marilyn Monroe was how everyone was looking at Marilyn Monroe. And he's the guy who actually took a step back and took a picture of the crowd taking the pictures. And that's what became iconic in the end is, is not just her is what was around it. So it's things like that, that for me make a difference is, is kind of, you know, where should your attention really be or what tells the best story? And for that photo, the best story wasn't Marilyn Monroe. It was, was how there was a bazillion people trying to get a, the shot of just her. And the best shot was actually the, the shot of the guys taking the shot. Yeah. And, and to your point, if there's, you know, 105 photos of Marilyn Monroe on that thing with the dress, but there's only one of the crowd actually being, you know, 
doing what they do, that's that that becomes the photo that's important. Um, of course, the other photo is interesting and it's everywhere and probably sold out multiple times uh, for a couple of photographers. But uh, uh, the one that tells the full story is when you put both together. So I, I like uh, I like what you're saying. Exactly. There. Um, speaking of uh, uh, of you know using your gear when you travel and so on and so forth, so some uh, listeners like to know what the creators are using. You mentioned a couple things, so you're a Sony. Uh, uh, I wouldn't say fanboy, but you you like your Sony's. That's something we discuss multiple times. <coughs> but you also like film. So so what do you shoot on? And and more interestingly, why why do you decided to go with these type of tools? Again, this is not a gear show, but it, we're always interested in learning what tools uh, the creators mm. use to to tell their stories. Well, to rapidly get get to the Sony stuff, um, you know, as a as a, a video guy, I mean, I, my 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 main cameras are Sony. I've been Sony cameras for a while. Like I followed them through from like F threes to FS sevens to, and I own an FX nine now. So instinctively, you know, to in, to have matched cameras, I've always kind of used um, Sony photo cameras. And I, I've you know, some people find their menus god awful, and and I just kind of so used to them that for me they're not they're not problematic. And and I mean they they. The, for me, they're they're really good cameras. They're not too bulky. Um, they 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 do what I want want them to do. But I, again, recently I've just sort of shifted towards when I travel. And recently I've traveled. I mean, I picked up travel since the pandemic ended. Um, I like. I don't, I don't even consider it limitations, but I like how what sort of street you know the, a film camera forces me down. So, I had um, a Pentax uh, K one thousand for a while that I picked up just like that. And then when I went to Chicago last year, um, I decided to give it to, to a friend of mine. And uh, the first place I went to when I was in Chicago, I said, okay, I'll go, I'll find some camera shots, I'll buy a new camera. And then I went to like a record store because where I was staying was near a, a couple of vinyl shops and stuff like that. And I walk in and they had like six cameras on sale. Wow. So then I Googled quickly, you know, each model. And one of them was the uh, Minolta XD11, which was actually... Um, it was kind of co-produced with Leica in a sense. So like the body is actually kind of like a, a Leica body, but in a Minolta name. So it actually has lots of Leica properties and it was like a hundred bucks. So I said, okay, you know, it was a good deal. And it was very well reviewed. So I took that and again, blind buy, never tested it. Shot my whole week in Chicago. I went and there was a Photoshop there um, uh, on uh, Michigan Avenue and they had bucket loads of film before it got too expensive too, or, or at least there it wasn't as expensive. So I bought a whole bunch of film that I'd never used, like black and white color, and just spent the whole week shooting with the camera, and like I know, there's a couple. It's funny. There was like I think there's like a, a couple shutter speeds where the, the the door doesn't close properly. But even that gave me cool shots. So yeah. once I you know I'll do more tests and figure out what it is. But that's kind of been my new my new friend for now is that the Minolta. And then um, my my daughter has music classes in Verdun uh, every Monday night, and on the corner of Wellington and De L'Eglise, there's a Salvation Army there. Yeah, and I shouldn't give away my secret because it's a uh, and I go every Monday and every Monday there's new stuff. And like every other, every like three or four weeks, there's a bunch of cameras that show up and I always look and then like I bought another one, which was like a Canon T90, which is like a fully automatic film camera that makes a crazy amount of noise when it winds the film. So I'm still mid roll on that one. So I'm going to see how that one comes out. But like, you know, I just kind of like having choices. Yeah. Um, you know, and eventually I count on going to that Salvation Army and there being five Leicas there for 20 bucks. <laughs> well, if that, if that happens, but I remind you that I live close by to that place. So that, that won't happen. Sorry, Luca. <laughs> I'll, I'll call you. <laughs> or we'll have to share. We'll have to share. Well, again, <laughs> yeah. If there's, if there's more than one, I'll call you and you could have okay, the other okay, one. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. But like one time I went and there was like a 368, there was like three eight millimeter film cameras and a bunch of projectors. Nice. And it was like I should have bought them all because they were like twenty bucks, and I, and I didn't do it, so that I regret. But uh, so I'm always kind of on the lookout. Like I like kind of exploring cameras. And again, my goal this year is to kind of upgrade and really get a uh, well to become a like a junkie like you. Obviously, well, I'm, I'm, so that's my people next, can't uh, can't see it, but uh, I'm holding the camera that uh, Luca should have, which is an M6. <laughs> I see it. I see and, it. Uh, and and uh, <laughs> that's but but again, it's the, yes, there there is the this whole trend, of course, and film is you know getting expensive to uh, uh to develop and then to uh to process and but hey you can you can develop your if you if you like black and white i mean i'm looking at your images from mexico you could have developed it at home and uh you can keep it on the budget mm -hmm. side you can buy bulk uh in bulk in terms of the film and you can uh, uh yeah. do, do it uh, do it yourself type of, yeah. uh, of situation yeah. you can even scan them with uh well you've got a pretty nice sony with 60 
five whatever megapixels 66, 66. <laughs> so i think that's enough to scan uh, that's afterwards. true you could use that to scan those yeah. and then uh, exactly oh, yeah. exactly cool stuff the, I, the one thing i like the most about film though is also is is and that's maybe me because of my age or where i came from and my background but i find like digitally the stuff i shoot digitally stays on the computer and the stuff i shoot on film i tend to mm. print and i tend to take more care of and i tend to like cherish a bit more like i have you know like a a wall of photos in my apartment from like travels and it's and, and unknowingly it's only the film ones that i ended up printing like there's a there's a certain richness to them you know and it, it ties back to like why 24 frames per second is the frame yep. like is the ideal frame rate for movies it's because it's enough frames to make the image fluid but not enough frames to make it life and you're just always transported somewhere else you know you're always transported into a moment that's not real so that's why like i can't stand high frame rate movies they, they make me sick anything like over 30 frames for me doesn't make sense uh, because it's you're not taken away you know the whole point of a movie is to be taken away and sometimes the whole point of a photo is to be taken away so for me grain makes those moments sort of nostalgic um like i've even started shooting with my digital camera with the monitor closed i don't i don't look at playback i just shoot my pictures and i make you know i i have confidence in my exposure and, I, and my my technical skills and i just leave the 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 lcd off and i'll walk around and shoot and then i'll de- like you know develop it yeah when i get home well for better or for worse well you 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 will be happy to know that there is a leica for that it's called a leica md and, and it doesn't have a screen in the back okay okay so this is not a leica show we should go back to visual storytelling uh, kind of is <laughs> yeah sometimes <laughs> that's my fault um so so speaking of uh, of uh, cinema um is there do you, do you take a lot i'm sure i, I know the answer to that but I, but i want the listeners to to um to deep dive a bit on that front how is cinema or films influencing, you know, your day-to-day um, inspiration, but also even your work, the work you do with um, with shoot. Um, I think a lot of my framing mindset is comes from cinema. Um, I consider myself a very good framer. Like I, I know how to frame people, I know how to frame images, and I'm very fast at framing. And, and that comes from. Um, I think you know watching movies, uh, and sometimes I watch movies purely just for the cinematography. Um, during the pandemic, uh, Roger Deakins, who was one of my favorite uh, directors, yep. uh, cinematographers, who did like a, a lot of Denis Villeneuve's latest work. Uh, he did um, all, a lot of Coen Brothers movies and stuff like that. Yeah, he started a podcast, and he, he was just so open about sharing information and how he works, and and and, and you know sometimes the simplicity of things that you think would be complicated. Um, so, but all these things kind of work in my mind. Like uh, I was watching, uh, I mean, I, this week I watched, um, I'd seen it before, but I just wanted to watch it for the cinematography of the Batman, the latest one that, that um, yeah. Matt Reeves did with uh, Robert Pattinson. And the, and the cinematography is gorgeous in that movie. And, and uh, you know, I mean, at one point I read things, you know, they use like these weird Russian, the uh, funky Russian lenses of the Helios 442s. So I think, you know, I bought one of those off eBay, got it shipped from the Ukraine. Everything is bocalicious. And it just has... <laughs> Oh Jesus! I mean, just round on the edges, and it has this weird '70s color vibe to it, like or like a very Chernobyl-y yeah. color vibe. And there's something really special about it. And they use those in specific scenes. And uh, you know, it's about framing, how to tell stories in frames too, and when what serves and what doesn't. You know, and, and I'm I'm very I'm, I'm you know, especially when it comes to film film work or my my directing work is like there's a difference between a beautiful shot and a beautiful shot that serves a story. And and the mm. line is sometimes very thin, you know, like I, I, there's nothing I hate more than movies that have gorgeous shots that don't mean anything apart from being gorgeous. Like if I'm saying, oh, wow, that's so nice looking and I'm forgetting about the story, then this, the shot isn't beautiful. I mean, it, it will make a nice demo reel. But for me, everything has to serve whatever it is. And I mean, if I'm doing an ad for orange juice and I mean, you know, it has to serve the orange juice. But if I'm doing something like for uh, something more creative and something more visual, uh, then whatever I'm doing has to serve that too. And I mean, you always have to keep in check, you know, if it's beautiful or if you're aiming towards making a beautiful shot, well, is it serving what your purpose is, what you're, the story you're trying to tell? And for me, those things are super duper important too. So I watch, I watch a lot of movies from directors of photography that I respect and admire to, to, to really find the balance between storytelling um and making things that are visually visually interesting too because you know you you obviously you can mix the two but one can't suffer from the other yeah i i agree and and 
I bet you're you're a bit like me, and you take your your inspiration, yes, from cinema and from art forms that are close to photography, but but also music, right? So there, there's this thing in my head where a photo, w there, automatically there'll be a soundtrack attached to it. I don't know if it's the same for you, but I cannot help it. It's just the way my brain is wired. I cannot look at an image without thinking about a song or a uh, a, a, a part of a lyric of a song or something like that. So I don't know. Uh, I, I think we're the same on that front. <laughs> I have a soundtrack for when I brush my teeth. Oh, well, there you go. Idea there you how go. much music accompanies me in life. You know, like I mean, this, before <laughs> I wake up, like the first thing I do when I wake up, no matter where I am, is go for coffee. But even before the coffee is, I put on music to get me out of bed into the, to making my coffee. I mean, I have, you know, I have music for every period of life or every idea, like for, you know, music for me is, is as much a driving element, even if it's not even present in the final image, you know, but I hear stuff all the time and music, music is integral too. So like, I mean, you know, yesterday when I was walking around taking pictures, you know, I, I picked specifically picked music to walk around with. And I often listen to movie music, actually. That's one of my things that inspires me a lot too, is sometimes uh, music without lyrics. So I, I'm, I'm a big collector of uh, soundtracks. So I listen to a lot of movie soundtracks. So, you know, like a lot of times, like uh, yesterday, it was kind of grim outside, so I put on the soundtrack to Interstellar by uh, Hans Zimmer. And it's nice. kind of very brooding and, and a slow build and very deep, you know. And it just kind of gave me this drive, and I just started looking at things a bit differently. And you know, but had I put on, um, I don't know, like Weezer, then I would have been like jumping around <laughs> and looking for happy people, or you know, like it influences me and and what I what I what I'm looking for. So I, I I put myself in a mood too, and music is is key to everything. I mean, it, it's it's uh, a. Mm. There's music playing until like three seconds before I fall asleep every day. Yep, that's uh, same here. So I guess this is why we uh, we have so mu so much to talk about when we when we exchange <laughs> on the on the when we're in person or, or through through all the platforms that we're on. Speaking of platforms, Lucas, so you're a working professional, and as you said, you know you don't always have time to like you know do personal projects and so on and so forth. What's your view on on social media? Uh, I like asking this question because it's a very contentious. I would say point and mm -hmm. a lot of people have a different uh, perception of it and use of it and I would throw in a second aspect of this question what would you say to a young person who's entering that creative realm and wants to make this a job and and how how should or should, shouldn't they pay attention to what's happening on social media See, I'm a, I have a very conflicted relationship with social media. Like, there's certain things that I, I love about it. And there's a lot of things that I really don't like about it. Um, I sometimes have to force myself to, to use it. Like, if you look at my Instagram, you'll see, like, sometimes there's, like, a lapse of, like, nine months without pictures. Um, like, for me, for, for me, social media is is a communication tool. And, uh, and again, it's to share. I've I sort of decided to make it more about visual things that inspire me like i i rarely if ever put personal like family more like i never show my kids on instagram uh that's a choice i made uh, a little while ago or if i do like it's like i think i put one photo of my kids when they were helping me do the matt halabowski video like they were my helpers and i like i took a picture of them from behind and i mean i have no problem with people that do differently but for me that's kind of like my choice about social media is like i find it, it things can stay too long or, you know, it's, it's, it's there's a whole, this deal about it. Do people really want to be there or not? Like, you know, but for professionally, I mean, it, it's, it really is the best way for people to see your work right now. Um, it's, 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 it's a good way to have people kind of share and comment on, on things that you, you've, you've done also, you know, like to see how people react to things that you do. Cause again, since everything is kind of, you know, we live in a world where like, you know, see all the videos that I made, they're not on TV now, they're on social media. Yeah. So for me to see how people connect to it, it's like reading comments on YouTube, reading comments on Instagram, you know, reading comments on Facebook. So, I mean, whether I like it or not, that's how things get around. Like no one watches, there's no more Music Plus. There's no, and, and even to, to, in a different way, like you, if it was on Music Plus, you would have no feedback at all because yeah. it's, it's a one it's a way conversation. environment. So yeah. it's a nice thing to be able to like, you know, you know, I've had people after videos write me, you know, like, hey, how did you do this? And how did you do that shot? You know, like the uh, the plane shots in the Matt Halabowski video were really fun to do. And I had my way of doing them. And a couple of people asked me about like that. So like, there's, there's something really fun about it. But I mean, like I, I, I got my, my, my door open in this business because um, at that time I was with my ex uh, and she saw on Twitter someone saying, hey, I'm looking for an editor for this project. Do you know anyone? And she's like, okay, call her, like, write her right now. I'm like, yeah, yeah. She goes, no, no, do it right now. Because she was much more uh, uh, social media friendly than I was. So I wrote back 
I got the job without, you know, really having to, to prove much, luckily, because I had no idea what I was doing. But I knew that I had a month to get before, like, they were going to shoot the images, you know? It was like, they were, like, really recruiting ahead of time. So I spent a month researching YouTube and da 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 and got good enough to do the job well enough to get more jobs and more jobs and more jobs. So, like, I owe my career to a certain, to a certain extent uh, to social media because it was, you know, and that's how things work now. So I think you have to embrace it. I think you have to decide quickly, though, how you want to use it. Because sometimes, like, it's if you decide that it's going to be a professional thing, and then all of a sudden you start putting photos of cats for three weeks and you go back to professional, like, you could confuse people. Um, you have to kind of decide what image you want to project and how you want to project it. So, like, I've decided for me, like, my photo feed of Instagram will say alternates between, you know, street photography that I'm proud of or, or photography that, I, that I've done and, like, sort of screen captures from videos that like it's a professional thing but it's very personal as well like it, it's it's kind of a, a weird mix but you know if you go back for like the last three maybe four years that's pretty much a pattern that i have you know like uh but I, i'm the worst person at tuning my own horn like I, I really sometimes over rely on other people doing it so i'm trying to get better at that but like i recently you know i, I make a point of sharing interesting things when i'm working uh, like i do like you know like uh setups uh, you know sort of behind the scenes stuff just to remind people that i work sometimes and again, sometimes it, it inspires questions and comments. You have to see lighting setups or, or, or I, you know, I'm lucky that I work with a lot of interesting people. Uh, yesterday I was shooting a documentary and I got to like, you know, shoot interviews with Michel Rivard and uh, Marcel Sabourin, who for people who know who he is, was, was, uh, nice. is still, uh, you know, a very well-respected actor from a certain generation of Quebec. Um, and a film directed by his son, who is uh, Jérôme Sabourin, who was one of the best cinematographers, not just here, but anywhere fantastic person so i got to learn from him a lot too um so yes it, it's it's an essential tool i mean it, it's the way that work and content is shared i just think um it took me a while to figure it out and how to kind of make it my own and how to be comfortable with it um and it's weird because sometimes i have my rules and sometimes i break them like you know every once in a while i'll just kind of write like personal stuff or i'll put a picture of a record i'm listening to which is generally contrary to what i'm doing but sometimes my mood inspires <laughs> it so I'm strict, but I kind of let myself slip every once in a while, and I'm I'm okay with that. Well, I guess rules are meant to be broken. That's how I see it. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, <laughs> L- L- Lucas. What's what's uh, what's next for you? So, what what projects actually are you working on, or something you have like you know mid to long term? Because yeah, social media is great to share an instant or a, a moment, but uh, are you driven also by long term uh, projects? J- j- just so you know, I. I Literally this morning, I woke up at like 4.30. That's that's another issue that I have. I wake up way, way too early. And I started to think, what am I doing? What am I doing with, with like posting images and then getting a certain amount of likes? And oh, yeah, great image. I need to be working on a long-term project. And so I decided to what? start looking at the body of work. And going back, I, sh- I started shooting in 2008, like more seriously. So I have a tons of images. Most of them are crap, but a couple of them are okay. And I started to notice, you know, some themes in there. So my question to you is, are you also driven by long-term projects like, like I just described? And, and what would be your, your, your next one? It's funny because, I mean, uh, we realize that we're in sync for a lot of things. And this, this year and more recently over the last few weeks, um, the, uh, during the summer, I usually work on a, a direct uh, parts of uh, Sucre Salé, which is a, a, like a cultural TV show here during the summer. And I don't think I'm going to do it this summer. <clears throat> so it's the first time in seven years that my summer is kind of free. But it also allowed me to have sort of that space of mind to say, you know, who am I really as an artist? And 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 I, I realized that, you know, this year I'm going to, my goal this year, I always give myself a goal at the, at the beginning of every year. Like last year, my goal was to master color correction on the, like to be a better color corrector for my videos uh, because I found I had I'd hit a plateau. And so I spent all year last year doing research, trying things, and I like I regraded all my old stuff. And it's just like, wow. So this year it's to really kind of forge an identity where if, if people hear my name, then there's certain things that come to mind firsthand. So um, it's a year where I've kind of prepared myself to maybe work a bit less professionally, to have more time personally, to better, to be a better professional down the road. Like, I mean, I have clear ambitions. Like I want to do fictional work. Uh, I love directing actors and I've sort of, I've been lucky because, because of my work where I've got to meet and I have good relationships with a lot of really, really strong talent, really good actors. Like I did a project uh, that if you scroll down my Instagram, you'll see there's a bunch of black and white photos that kind of tell a certain story. There's like a video compliment to that one. 
and it was directing a bunch of actors doing scenes where the whole goal of it was to direct them where they had scripts and and things to act, but there was no no sound recorded. So it was all all based on acting. Uh, and that was a lot of fun to do. And that sort of made me realize that fiction is something that I've been kind of leaning towards slowly, but I think it's time to kind of put the gas on that idea and put myself in a position where someone would be ready to take a chance to give me something like that. Because it's obviously, you know, you can't, it doesn't come out of nowhere. You have to kind of, but people do give chances to people. And, and I think I have a good enough relationship with people at large and a good enough reputation for that if, you know, things could happen. So I'm really gearing myself up towards working on me, my identity, and and kind of creating these these personal projects with this kind of new time that I new time that I haven't had recently to really forge a, a better identity. Like I've been writing a movie for the last like four years, and maybe I might, I might like you know go to Mexico for two weeks and just just write whether it's good or not. Like I mean, you don't get better unless you practice, and like you know, generally speaking, your first script isn't 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 going to sell a movie. So, uh, um. And, and, you know, I, I say it half joke or one third jokingly, like I'm getting old sort of, so I'm not a kid anymore, <laughs> but I mean, it's never too late to to change things around. Like I saw yesterday, just by coincidence, you know, it was a reminder, like, you know, Bourdain didn't start doing his shows, his TV shows until he was 45. So I'm 46, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, like, it, you know, it, it's a job where like, you know, your the age doesn't necessarily have to stop you. Like, you know, I might stop running around with the camera uh as crazy as i am now but like it won't stop having ideas and so i'm really working on on cementing who i am as an artist uh and really discovering you know where i want to go down the line and it's kind of exciting too because i've never sort of i've always i've been lucky that that i've never had to look for work for the last like five six seven years i've just always had a full table like as soon as something finishes something else starts like i have regular clients i do a lot of work for the Théâtre du nouveau monde uh, like I had Sukhi Sali, you know, I have regular musical work. Uh, I do, you know, I have my corporate clients that are regular. So like my years sometimes are kind of filled before they start, which is comforting. But it always ends up getting to the point where it gets too filled and I don't have enough time for me. So this is kind of a me year. Um, and I'm kind of excited to see what it'll do because I haven't, I don't think as a professional, I've had the space of mind to think this much about what I want to do. So it's kind of exciting. Well, that's that's very uh, exciting and inspiring for you know other artists who might want to invest time into their craft and into you know their own personal project. It is possible. Uh, you have to work your ass off for you know ten, twenty years, but it is possible at some point to oh, take yeah. a step back and also um, you know invest time in in yourself in your own growth. And that's something that uh, I hope this podcast is giving you know the listeners uh, hope about because sometimes you can get into you know. A, a mindset where you just work, 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 and then you don't even know why you're doing it. But uh, conversations like the one we're having this uh, morning uh, is uh, is very, very interesting and, and gives hopes to people. So I, I I like that. So Luca, I I do too. And, uh, yeah, I, I really want to thank you for uh, for your time uh, this morning. It's been very, very, very interesting conversation. Um, again, we are friends, so we talk a lot about this. But I think there's a lot of value for the listeners because. Um, you are a very talented person. You're a very kind person, very generous person, but also people can learn from you. Uh, if people want to learn more about your work, where should they go to learn more about the uh, Luca Rubnik uh, work? Um, I guess, I mean, the place where people will probably see the most stuff coming by is on my Instagram. So it's uh, at Lucas Rupnik, simply. Um, a lot of stuff, is, a lot more stuff is going to be coming through Shoot Studio, also those shootstudio.ca, uh, since I do a lot of work through them. Um, but my main communication vehicle is Instagram. I think like I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I don't see myself on TikTok anytime soon or anything like that. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, but I share more on Instagram than on Facebook. Uh, and like I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, that's where I have most of my interactions with people who ask me questions and are curious about things. Uh, which is another fun, a fun thing is to being able to talk to people and, and kind of share ideas. You know, I give uh, photo, I give conferences on photo from time to time, and I get a lot of feedback from those, and it kind of makes me rethink about things too. So. Um, I guess if there's anywhere to go, it'd be the Instagram, and that's where my any new work that I do will show up. Um, and yeah, I'm, and I'm always open to chat with people too. It's fun. I think uh, I think one of the good things about a podcast like this is that it, it 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 you know it makes you see people that you wouldn't necessarily have crossed paths with, or or at least listen to them. And then it opens the doors to different fields of work and different ways of seeing things. And I think that's the most interesting thing too. Is you know you just. I mean, it's a job where, I don't like saying the word job, it's a field where, you know, the more you see, the more you, you inspire, and, and it's, 
you know, it's never ending and it's a beautiful thing that there's always going to be like, I'll see something tomorrow that I've never seen before that'll just kind of like blow me away. Um, you know, it's like finding a record that came out in 1971 that you've never heard and all of a sudden like it's your new favorite song of all time. Like it's been <laughs> there the whole time. And just for some reason, you never cross paths with it. And sometimes people are like that too. Well, thank you so it's much, Lucas. Really cool thing. This is this is very very cool, and you can uh, rate this podcast if you like it. Give it a five star review. And I've been Fred Ranger. Please enjoy life. <laughs>